Durs. That's what my uh, my buddy, who's a Raiders fan, he sends Durs now instead of like Raiders. It's Durs because Durs kind of sounds like a dumb thing to do, or just like it just sounds like ineptitude, you know. Anyways, welcome on in. It is yours truly, Zachariah. He is Sean O'Connell. This is the Silver and Zach podcast on Twitter. Follow my man at Real OC Sports. I'm at Zach Sports, Z A K Sports. OC, uh, another week, another disgusting loss to talk about. This time, you know, the whole football world was up in arms about Jeff Saturday getting hired as the Colts head coach and how if it's an interim head coach, you don't have to go through the Rooney rule. And people were just mad in general, thinking that, you know, a lot of ex coaches found it offensive that they got a guy off the street, even though it really wasn't off the street. He played for a lot of years, went to the playoffs a bunch. As you know, offensive linemen are sometimes some of the smartest football players in the locker room, dealt with Peyton Manning, and then he stayed close to the game. He was actually an advisor for the Colts and talked with um, Frank Wright, who got fired, um, talked to him every week. He was a consultant, and he met with the team several times. So it wasn't just bringing, up, you know, bringing some random guy off the street like you or me. He was a little bit closer to coaching than that, but um, – First, I want to get your we, thoughts on. Hold on, can we talk about this for for one more second here? Yeah, because because it's still a storyline. It's still something people are talking about, and you know, I I kind of laughed at it. I I chuckled about Jeff Saturday being the interim head coach because it is like an unorthodox move. But I was actually shocked to see how many people who are in and around football were like real, real big mad, like hurt by the idea that Jeff Saturday would would get the opportunity that he got. Yeah, and then they lost their mind. Yeah, like they people were going crazy about it. And that that bothers me, right? So you had like you had Bill Cower ranting about it. You had a Joe Thomas, a fellow offensive lineman, like breaking the rule of the fraternity of offensive linemen ranting about it, saying it was like one of the most egregious things that they've ever seen in the NFL. And that stop it. What are you talking about? Josh McDaniels is a head coach of an NFL franchise right now. Jeff Saturday knows more about football than that guy does. It's not like he was some backup nobody on a team. And by the way, those backup nobodies on teams sometimes end up being great coaches because they have to learn the game. They can't get by on their talent. This is a dude whose entire life was dedicated to NFL football, right? He he made the case in his press conference. He's like, look, I, I get it. People don't think I'm qualified. I played 12 years. I played with five different Hall of Famers. I know a lot about the way that you prepare, the way that, you know, good coaches coach, all that kind of stuff. And in other pro sports, in the NBA, we've seen this happen like seven times. And sometimes to great success. Where a player retires, was a good player, was a general on the floor type, and then just transitions seamlessly to the bench. Jason Kidd, Steve Nash, Steve Kerr, all these people. I wouldn't bring up Nash as a good example just yet, but yeah. Okay. So Yeah, usually usually point guards, Mark Jackson, and they might do some broadcasting in between. But yeah, I mean, it, it happens a lot. I think it's just in football, there's so this mentality of you have to pay your dues. And I feel like they just yes. feel like he skipped the line. Like they wanted it because they wanted him to be an offensive line coach. Then they wanted him to, you know, like they wanted him to go through the progression. So, I mean, a lot of those fools are like, I was making 20 grand a year cutting tape, you know, sleeping two hours a day yeah. for like seven years before I got an opportunity. And this guy just waltzed off the set of get up on ESPN and became yes. the coach. So I think it was more yes. just like jealousy or anger than anything else. He cut the line. But guess what? That's what happens when you are an all pro. When you're a team captain, that's the stuff that happens. It just – Michael Strahan cut the line. He's on Good Morning America. You know how many <laughs> – after being an NFL football player, you know how many people who are, like, dedicated broadcast professionals want that job? They make fat money on Good Morning America. Michael Strahan got that job because of the name recognition associated with him and his big gap team, and he's incredible at it, okay, because high-achieving people – are typically good at multiple things. Jeff Saturday may or may not turn out to be a great head coach. He might be terrible at it. I don't know. But the idea that other people in the football fraternity, other people who know the kind of dedication and the kind of professionalism that Jeff Saturday displayed 
for 12 years in his career are laughing at him and saying it's egregious, stop it. Yeah. Knock it I off mean, right now. The nepotism that runs rampant in your business, right? Guys that are on coaching staffs because their dad's the head coach, on coaching staffs because their dad's a head coach somewhere else. Those guys, that's what you should be talking about as being egregious. That's Jeff Saturday. His whole life is football. Yeah. Maybe he knows how to coach. Maybe he doesn't. Good enough to beat the Raiders. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, look, like, like you said, I, I chuckled. I tweeted something out about it. Like the weekend is now coaching the Colts or something like that. And, you know, I, I found it somewhat amusing, but I didn't think that it deserved the vitriol that it got. And I was certainly happy for him. And look, coaching, he has assistance. You know, he's got offensive core. Well, and then they kind of doubled down and made the play caller a guy who's never called plays before. But, yeah, I mean, it worked. A lot of it is just making sure things like the locker rooms together. Honestly, what I think a lot of which why I've been calling for Josh McDaniels' head is that a lot of it is, I mean, yes, you do need experience, and he's going to learn on the job, I'm sure. There's going to be a bunch of stuff that he had no idea about. But a lot of it is galvanizing the troops, making sure your coordinators have the you know, the, the game plan down, and just doing stuff that is not – I'm not trying to make I'm I'm not trying to simplify coaching, but a lot of it is not crazy. I'm not going to go Jim Ursay and be like it's it's very simple. I don't know if you saw his press conference. That guy's such a loon. But <laughs> uh, he he just seems like the kind of guy that I think guys would rally around and what better team to, to play than the Raiders even though it was on the road and once again the Raiders pooped the bed. So I have a bunch of Raiders stuff not necessarily tied to the game. If you want to get into the game, we can. I've got more off the field stuff. The game, I mean, look, another one-score loss for them. I think that's six on the year or something like that. And it was just just another sad day, and it basically culminated with, you know, Derek Carr crying, yes. like literally having to hold back tears. But what did you make of the actual game before you before we can get into the uh, stuff on the, you know, off the field? Well, look, it's, they're just they're a really bad team right now, and um, trying to find positives like josh jacobs is a positive great running back okay he's a, he's a very very quality person um to have on your roster if he ends up somewhere else his career could could look a lot different Devonte adams is still one of the top three wide receivers in the league he just is to be playing the role he's playing on a bad raider team with a guy who i consider to be a mediocre quarterback i know that you think Carr's better than that and for him to be putting up numbers with everybody in their dog knowing that he's the number one weapon, he they, they can try and compensate for him. They can try and bracket coverage. They can put one underneath, put one over the top. They can try and knock him off his route, press him at the, at the line of scrimmage. Devontae Adams just gets the job done. So there are some positives, right? Max Crosby had another great game. Um, that's against a pretty bad Indianapolis Colts team, but – the Colts offensive line is not the weak point on that squad, right? So, uh, look, you have you have some bright spots in your personnel. Unfortunately for the Raiders, I think that because the rest of your roster is so bad and is underperforming so strongly that those those bright spot individuals are probably best used to, to trade and get picks. But that, that's neither here nor there. We'll talk about roster management another time. As far as this game goes... It's just, you know, it's more of the same. They just don't have what it takes down the stretch to make the plays necessary to get themselves wins, even against a hapless Colts team who trotted some guy off the freaking couch to be your head coach. Yeah, and I, you know, it, they just, they lack identity. And this why I, this is why last week I was harping on it, and I'm going to harp on it again this week. I go back to the coaching because, I just feel like the talent is there on the roster. I do. And, but they, when you watch the game, the, my biggest takeaway from the game, yes, they had a depleted uh, linebacking core and going against Jonathan Taylor, that's not a good combination. The Colts' first move that they made was bringing Matt Ryan back in after they cleared, declared that he was going to be benched for the rest of the season. And he looked, um, you know, invigorated. And, you know, but it's just when I watch them play both on defense and offense, there's no confidence of this is what I want to do or this is what we're going to do. Even when it goes well, it feels like, oh, well, that's a relief. You know, not like we were, I mean, with the exception, I should say, 
of either Crosby on defense or Devontae Adams on offense. When those guys are cooking, it looks like they know what they want to do and they're and they're exerting their will on the other team. But all the other plays, which makes up 80% of the game probably, I just feel like they're going, well, I hope this works. Or, yeah, I'm going to go. I mean, the tackling was terrible. I just I feel like it's a huge lack of identity, and I feel like that's on the coach because the coach needs to go into the week, right? I'm assuming these guys start Monday, even though the players don't come in till Tuesday, don't start practicing till Wednesday. I'm assuming the coach gets there Monday at 4 in the morning or whatever. Immediately, you have to identify, what did we do good last week? What did we do poorly last week? Who are we playing next week? And what can we do against them to win the game? And what, like, how can we hide our mistakes against this team for the next game? And I just feel like there's no identity, no game plan. And to me, that falls on the coaching, not the players. Uh, I mean, look, I, I, I still believe, and this is a disagreement we have all the time. I still believe that you have a quarterback who can't elevate the rest of the team around him. Right. I, and I know people don't like to say bad things about Carr, even though we, you know, he's crying and, and that's going to be made fun of and he's going to be turned into a meme for that, probably deservedly so. Um, like when when there's deficiencies on your roster, there's deficiencies on every roster, right? Tom Brady played with deficient rosters for years in New England. Aaron Rodgers plays with deficient rosters in Green Bay. This year's not a great example of him overcoming that, but for the bulk of his career, right? I mean, Kansas City has its own issues and they're the best team in football more years than not. But Derek Carr is not the guy who erases mistakes from everyone else. Derek Carr is not the guy who, when push comes to shove, you just know he's going to make a play. You can't say that about him. I don't think there's ever been a time in his career when you can say that about him. And if you don't have great coaching and you don't have great supporting cast, you have to have an elite QB. I agree. And the don't. Yeah, I agree. I guess I guess my counter to that would be because you're right. Patrick Mahomes loses Tyreek Hill. He makes, you know, chicken soup out of chicken bleep. And Aaron Rodgers, they've never really gotten him tight end. I mean, they fell into Devontae Adams, but other than that, they haven't gone out and trade they never trade for anybody. And when they draft, they're usually drafting defense. But I would argue that those guys have coaching around them that lifts them up. Andy Reid's one of the greatest coaches ever. I know he I know he only has one Super Bowl, but he's been to two others. He's been in countless conference championship games. That guy's obviously an elite coach. So he lifts the team up. He has the game plan going in. He helps he helps Mahomes. You're right. Those quarterbacks are better and I'm not comparing Carr to that, but I'm telling you that the coaching and the organization help those guys lift like exactly what you're saying. You need a quarterback to lift the team. There's the stuff around those quarterbacks that are helping them do that. And Carr is getting nothing. Listen to this, because now I'm going to go, uh, forget the micro, okay? It was another crap loss and a lost season. I did see an article where some ESPN guy wrote that the Raiders could still win eight games. That probably was before the Colts game. Listen Sorry, to this. Was that was that uh, article written by Zachariah from the Silver and Zach? Because <laughs> no. that's, no, that's been you every aside from this episode and the last one, that was you all year long. No, no, no. Look at the, Oh, see, look at the schedule. They could string together 10 wins. No, it's true. It's true. It's true. And that pretty much, it looks like I wrote it. The guy talks about the schedule and how they can run this off. And they still, I mean, it was like I wrote it, but no, it wasn't me. Uh, check this out. Raiders first round picks from 2019 to 2021. I know this Alex, Alex, Alex Leatherwood. And I loved the pick at the time. I don't know enough about it, but I, I figured, look, Alabama, tackle, guard, put him somewhere. A huge Alabama guy, offensive line, love it. Cut. 2020, Henry Ruggs, he's behind bars right now. Damon Arnett is out there waving around AK-47s on his Facebook Live story. Cut. Jonathan Abram just recently got cut. Josh Jacobs, who's having a great year, fifth year was declined. And then uh, Kellen Farrell, Fifth year decline, and he was a healthy scratch on Sunday. That's three picks in 2019, one of which is good, Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs. And then the rest of them, that's uh, two picks in 2020 and one pick in 2021. So three, four, five, six picks, five are gone or are going to be gone. And one, you got to work out a deal to get Josh Jacobs back if he even wants to return. 
And the drafts previous to the ones that you've cited, uh, all those guys I think are out of football or on other rosters right now also. so I didn't even want to go any further back, I'm sure. Yeah, so if, if you do go further back, you'll find that the same pattern continues. The outlier is actually Josh Jacobs being halfway decent and staying on a roster. Yeah, look, it's – so what we could talk about, right, what we can sum this up as – organizational ineptitude lack of institutional control is what you get penalized for in the ncaa like you just whether you want to say it's ownership it's management it's coaching it's quarterback play it, that's the hierarchy right you start at the very top no 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 oh see you start with mark davis the owner i said i said ownership at the top oh i'm sorry i'm sorry i missed that one yeah, ownership. Okay. The, yep. the shit the shit rolls downhill. You start with the owner. Okay. And then you just watch. If the owner's not doing things right, and apparently he's not because they can't even afford to fire your boy Josh McDaniels. VP of operations, right, general manager, right. head coach, and then you go down the line. And yeah, and it's all been look, I'm on a text thread. I know you don't you don't strike me as a text thread guy. You're not on a lot of text threads, are you? With like old school college or high school homies or something, where like there's like ten people. I'll tell you what. I'm on a family text thread for my family, a family text thread for my wife's family, a high school boys uh, text thread, and then a text thread for my my Pac-12 Today show, and that's about four text threads too many for me. Those yeah, are- yeah. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> That's kind of what I would have, I would have figured you'd had to have been on a couple of family ones. It's good that you have your high school boys one. And then, yeah, you got to have a professional one, but you should have one for PFL too. Anyways, I'm on a text thread and it's only, so there's, I have one where it's like a bunch of homies, like 10. And then there's another one. And then, oh, your boy, Sal, Gabe, you love that guy. You two get along like two peas in a pod and annoys the hell out of me. Um, he's so, he's so old school that he's got like the original iPhone. So he can't be on text threads where like, unless <laughs> everybody has an iPhone, he can't be on it. So we have this separate one where there's just four of us. It's me, Artie, his cousin and, and Sal and everybody on the thread hates car. And I'm constantly the car apologist. And they're like, like the, one of the guys, Artie's cousin is a diehard Raiders fan and hates his guts. And all he talks about is how he's on pace to have the worst win loss record in the history of the sport and like worst winning percentage. Like he's a bum. He's a loser. He hates the guy so much, but I constantly see everywhere where people are like, Derek Carr, you're probably on the lower percent of it. I'm on the higher percent of it. And some people hate him. And some people think that he's great and just needs to change a scenario, but it, it's unarguable that when he looks good, he looks great. He's certainly got an arm. And he, he, he makes his reads well. And when he looks bad, yeah, he, he'll get happy feet and stuff like that. But there's no arguing that every single thing that's been put around him has set him up to fail with the exception of getting Devonte Adams. But other than that, draft picks have been horrible. Offensive line has been horrible. Defense has been historically bad. Coaching staff, a complete mess. Chaos everywhere. Move to I mean, all the sorts of things that DUI, I mean, like waving guns on like this guy has been given the worst hand and expected to win the World Series of Poker. Look, I appreciate your ability, your willingness to be the outlier constantly in these scenarios, right? I That's one thing, you, your unshakable confidence in in life is your greatest asset and your biggest downfall. Okay, because you just gave an example of people who pay close attention, root for this Raider team, want it to be successful, watch the NFL religiously. And you gave of gave three examples and myself to make it four of people who are telling you that that Derek Carr is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And you are the guy who says, no, I will die on this hill. I will stand on an island and I will play white knight. I will defend this man. Look, he he's not good. He's he's okay. He's not the worst quarterback in the league. He's not among the best quarterbacks in the league. He's not among the top half of quarterbacks in the league. And unless you have elite everything else that you just cited, which you very accurately went through and showed that they do not, 
that guy can't do it for you. I, I didn't want this to turn into an episode trashing on Carr because I think it was silly that he he got up in front of the press and was crying and doing that whole I care so much thing. Like, stop it, all right? That that loses you half of your locker room. Guys do not like that, okay? They're, they're professional. Yeah, but OC, like OC, 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 number one, if you don't think it was contrived, and I don't think it does, but this, this guy's too much of like a Christian and everything about him seems real. I think he only cares like that stupid Russell Wilson TikTok. I don't know if you've seen it, but I think all he cares about is uh, family, God, and football, probably in that order. Like, I truly believe that that was real up there and not like some made up thing. And also at this point, what does he have to lose? Even if he has to call out guys and lose half the locker room, F it. What else are you going to – I mean, at this point, you got to try anything. Sorry, go ahead. Well, the, I mean, I guess you're not wrong, right? There's, They're scraping the bottom. You can't fall far from here. But this is a guy who's supposed to be a leader and supposed to be a continual starter in the National Football League, right? And if they reorganize a roster and you have a bad reputation as that dude who without – we talked about this on the last episode – Without really earning the right to, you start calling out teammates, teammates or whatever. And, and and look, I don't I don't think that he crossed the line in that regard. I just think that there's a very very particular, unique atmosphere to NFL locker rooms, and I've never been in one, but I've been lucky enough to do shows with guys who spend a lot of time there and have friends who spend a lot of time there. And it's not like a high school locker room, okay, where you want to see your starting quarterback crying because he cares so much. It's not like a college locker room where it's all about your love and your passion, your effort. Like this is professionalism and a guy going up there and being like, I care more than everyone else. And I'm crying, whether it's genuine or not. Like if you genuinely are going to stand up there and cry, don't go up there. Cause it's, people aren't going to receive it the right way. And they're not, by the way, his Raiders teammates are not receiving it the right way. Every report out there shows that half of them dislike what's going on. And you know, what would fix it winning. You know what the Raiders are not going to do to fix it. Win. So Carr needs to be very, very careful, and he can't be because he's too authentic in your mind. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I just think that he's frustrated, and I would be too, given the cards that he's been dealt over his Raider tenure. I mean, I, I can't think of a scenario in which somebody has been more set up to fail and not succeed. I think that if you swapped Mahomes and Carr I'm not saying that Carr would be as great and as amazing as Mahomes has been, but I think he would have a ton of success, a ton of playoff wins, and maybe something bigger than that. I don't know. And I think that Mahomes would still show his greatness, but would not be held in nearly as high a regard as he is now. Because Mahomes walked in, great situation. Alex Smith is there, sit one year, come in after that, Andy Reid, weapons all over the place, Kelsey Hill, all this stuff. And then he got to four straight AFC championship games, two Super Bowls and one, one. I think Clark not probably wouldn't have done that, but something close to it, maybe two super, or, you know, two AFC championship appearances. Okay. So you know how we talked about the squandered leads for the Raiders. We talked about yeah. the fact that they've given up three 17 point leads. You we, we could also talk about the fact that the Raiders are losing games and they're losing close games. They're losing one possession games. Okay. Indianapolis was the sixth time that Derek Carr had a fourth quarter possession to take a drive down and get the lead back for his team. Now, maybe his defense would have squandered it with time left on the clock, but six times this year, he's had an opportunity in the fourth quarter to drive down and get his team into a, a winning score position. Yeah. Six times he has failed. Yeah. No, I mean, look, I can't argue with that. And I'm not saying he's playing out of this world. Again, I'm just saying the stuff around him, the coaching staff and, and everything else has not put him in a great position. And so I, I, I just feel like if the pieces around him were the, uh, were not the problem and he was, I feel like it would be way more obvious to me. It's way like, if I were to list every issue with the Raiders, Carr would be like maybe 10th on it. I've never sat down and done it, but I'm guessing it would be around 10. But anyways, let's move on. I want to get to this um, Damian Lillard thing because I found it hilarious. But you, who rarely Wait, contacts me because this relates. Hold up. Time out. We are what? not moving what? off the Raiders until we address the idea 
that the guy you want fired is going to be the coach for at least two more years because the organization is quote unquote cash poor and can't afford to fire him. How are you going to try and move off the Raiders before we talk about that? Oh, hang on. If you would allow me to, to finish, I'm not getting away from the Raiders. I'm just getting away from the car topic. Okay. All right. But but we can go there. You're passionate about it. Talk to me about. It. I mean, yeah. I've been calling. I look. I wanted to start a hashtag. I wanted to get it trending. Fire McDaniel's. Hire Peyton. I, I. So I'm. I'm all for it. And yeah, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, uh, part of me thinks that Mark Davis does still have some feelings within him that McDaniel's can get it done. But I would not be surprised in the least if. The reason why they're keeping him on is because they're cash poor. Did that come out as fact or speculation? That is something that has been widely circulated, that the Raiders are, quote, cash poor, and that's why you saw the the vote of confidence from Mark Davis, which usually is a precursor to being fired, right? Usually when a GM or or an owner is asked about the coach and gives like a sort of a generic, like, no, I still believe in so-and-so. No, you don't. You just have to say that publicly before you have a conversation with him about how he's bleeping fired. But this is this has been reported on. Um, Plashke got Plashke had it. A bunch of people have kind of co-signed, and multiple sources are saying that Mark Davis, because his money is tied up in the Raiders, and is not some dude who has you know fifteen dot com businesses and uh, 1,200 streams yeah, of income. He's not Cronky. He's he, not he's Cronky not, or Jerry Jones. Right? He's not necessarily flush with cash the way that some of these other people are, right? And when you're a multi-billionaire or a billionaire, the idea of paying a 7 or 10 or $12 million buyout is laughable to you, right? I mean, your bank account and my bank account compared to a bank account, that's the equivalent of us tossing five bucks at someone to go away. And that's not how Mark. That's not Mark Davis's reality because he's like the trust fund baby that inherited this team from his dad. Like this is, this is where his outside income comes from. And I, I get it. He's got other investments. He's got an outside portfolio, but he doesn't have the kind of ludicrous wealth that some of these other owners have. And the report is that he's also kind of a tightwad, and that you know he still drives that damn Dodge Caravan or whatever. So he's going to. He's going to keep Josh McDaniels around because he doesn't want to pay a buyout and he doesn't want to pay a new head coach on top of that. Because every time you fire someone and you hire someone new, right, you're you're paying the old salary plus the new salary. It's financially, it's a terrible, terrible business model. But the Raiders are the only team, as we talk about their ineptitude on the field and we talk about the coaching, we talk about the leadership, we talk about the decision making. They appear also to be the only team in the NFL that is not just a money printing machine that can do whatever they want financially. That speaks to our point we made previously of how it all rolls down from the top. Yeah, I mean, look, if that's the actual reason, and I guess I would want to know how much that would actually affect Mark Davis. Like, would that mean that he wouldn't be able to pay his light bill if he had to pay two coaches at the same time? But if it's, I mean, if it's just that he's making less money than he would, but he's still going to be fine, then that's not a good enough reason for me. I mean, because winning is the most important thing. And they're kind of at a crossroads where they have a tight end that they're paying a, a decent amount of money in Darren Waller. Uh, you know, scuttlebutt is he wants more money, of course. Uh, shocker. They have a, a high priced wide receiver that they traded picks for and gave maximum money to. They have Derek Carr, who's on a, team friendly salary but still getting a good chunk of change they're they've paid crosby you know they've paid um jones Th- there's guys that they're paying but if they're not winning especially at this horrendous clip they've got to figure out whether or not they want to move on or stick with what they've got and believe in believe in their roster and if that's the case mcdaniels has to go and you got to get somebody in there that's going to get the maximum potential out of that roster sean payton <clears throat> <laughs> I know but I mean it's one of the two. if they're going to keep McDaniels on and he's shown that he's not a good coach then you got to start trading these guys and you got to rebuild and if you believe it I mean see what McDaniels can do in a rebuild but do not keep McDaniels on and then continue to pretend like you're trying to win because he's shown that he can't uh, anyways I'll move I on to uh, I was coach. 
Yeah. I, I don't think, but by the way, Sean Payton literally makes 10 times as much money uh, as, as Josh McDaniels. Sean Payton, uh, most recent reported head coaching salary, $10 million. So 10 times as expensive to have him. Good luck. 10 times? McDaniels is only making a million a year? Yeah, we talked about this. Yeah, I keep forgetting that. That's ridiculous. They can't afford to get away from that? You got to look up McDaniel's contract. There's no way he took a $1 million. Coaches get $5 million a year. Minimum. All right, you looked that up. I was going to get to another topic that you're passionate about, but since you burged in there with your uh, passionate about the uh, the coaching thing, I'm going to do Sorry. my Damian Lillard uh, we, thing. Hold on, hold on. Uh, salary, uh, Google is uh, unreliable on this. The first one says a million dollars. It looks like he's making between four and five million dollars a year. So, so Sean Payton might only be twice as expensive. There we go, which is standard. All right, Damian Lillard. As you know, he wears number zero because he's from Oakland. Very proud Oakland native. And he sounded off on his favorite team. Lifetime Raiders fan, Oakland native, said he wouldn't blame Adams, Crosby, and Waller if they wanted out after this season. If Crosby, Tay, and Waller get TF out of Vegas, I wouldn't be mad at him this bad. That's what he tweeted. So I just wanted to throw that antidote out there. I mean, not to pour salt on the wound, but I mean, even basketball players, famous basketball players are noticing from afar how disastrous of a season this has been. That, that, by the way, is from a guy who's shown more loyalty to his organization than any other NBA player in the last 15 years. Maybe right? to a fault. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Damian Lillard is like the least understanding of professional athletes. are like, hey, get yourself out of that bad situation because he's a dude who's riding and potentially dying with the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah. No, I mean, and 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 he's had enough. So, yeah, I mean, you'd think he'd had enough in Portland not getting enough help around him because he certainly hasn't been the problem in the in the Northwest. But, yeah, and then this one, uh, as, as as the listeners probably know by now, this friendship is very one-sided, and you rarely contact me. But so when I received a text from you out of the blue, I said, what, the, I mean, is something wrong? Is everything okay? I was, I, honestly, I was worried to start. And it was to notify me, that Blake Martinez had announced his retirement. Here's the article uh, from Levi Damien. Um, I know, I know, this headline reads like it's out of The Onion. Uh, the Onion, for those that don't know, is like a fake newspaper with fake headlines and stuff like that. Pretty funny. But it's real. Last week, a month ago, the Raiders signed Blake Martinez to a free agent contract. Last week, he came in for the injured Divine Diablo and saw season high 63 snaps and led the team with 11 tackles. And Martinez may have been in line to get more snaps the rest of the way as well, but Diablo sent to injured reserve. Instead, he abruptly retired as he announced on his Instagram page. And somebody, quote, treated it. And to top things off, Raiders linebacker Blake Martinez has retired. He missed practice yesterday due to personal reasons, and now we know why. I wouldn't play for this Raiders team either. Um, I felt like you felt like that was a little bit of rock bottom because that must have stuck out. I think you sent me... uh, Check it out. This guy would rather not play football than play for the Raiders. I This is what I really believe happened with, with Blake Martinez, okay? I think that Blake Martinez um, was proving to himself that he's still a quality NFL starter, and he wanted to be done with the NFL before the NFL is done with him, right? So he signed with the Raiders knowing they absolutely needed him, and then he played a game for the Raiders. He led them in tackles, and he said, okay, just like I thought, I can be the best player on at least a bad defense uh, for a game or two. And then he just said, cool, I'm done. I'm 28 years old, and he's got other interests. He's a, he's a Stanford grad, so he's got that degree from the farm. I mean, the dude's going to be just fine in life. He made – I looked it up the other day. I think he made $41 million or something in his career, and that's plenty for any young man, especially one who's intelligent and well-educated. Uh, the best part about it is, you know what he's going to do. You know what, you know what his thing is. You know what his side hustle is, Zachariah, that he would rather focus on than playing for the Las Vegas Raiders. I actually, I did. I saw this Pokemon cards, Pokemon cards. He, he collects and trades and sells Pokemon cards, especially the high end rare ones. He sold like a, a special, whatever Charizard card for 700 grand. 
which I think is the the the, the second highest price for a single card ever paid. Like, dude is just uh, he's living life, you know, and he's yeah. yeah. He plays he plays kind of a hard nosed brand of football. He he stuck his face in a lot of contact, and we know about CTE. We know about those problems. So as much as I'd like to use this as a punchline for the Raiders. I think this is just a guy who's 28 years old with a lot of football behind him and a lot of money in his pocket and sees that, you know, now's the right time to get out. And thank goodness that the NFL now pays these guys enough that they can do it when they're still in their 20s and they still have, you know, most of their prime ahead of them. Yeah, but my guess is he wouldn't be making that decision if he was playing for (laughs) – I don't know, the Chiefs or something like that. You know, I, look, I feel if like if you're chasing, the situation if you're chasing, with Las Vegas had something to do with it. He was with the, he was with the Giants, and the Giants are having a great year, right? So that's why I say I think that, that you know, he, he may be just, like, proving to himself that he can still do it because the Giants moved on from and him. And then walk out. Yeah, yeah. And then – you know, they, they're having a great year. That that can't feel good. So you say, all right, well, am I still who I think I am? Am I still someone who can play? He goes, he plays, 11 tackles. I mean, that's a season for some guys, right? For some of these backup linebackers, these special teams dudes, 11 tackles is a season. He had that one game in a Raider uniform. He's like, all right, cool. I'm out, guys. Yeah. Well, more from after the game. This is all from the great Vic Tafer, who's been covering the Raiders for years. Um, now the Raiders are sure to be the punchline to a new set of jokes this week. Team owner Mark Davis hired McDaniels and thought he was fortunate. McDaniels was even available. Now he's probably wondering whether he made a huge mistake bringing McDaniels to Las Vegas in the first place. Mark Davis was reportedly in the Raiders locker room after the game, presumably talking to the coaching staff, though that's still unknown. As for Carr's emotion after the game said it all, Raiders QB and Coke, Co-captain couldn't hide his despair regarding how this season, which started with big time aspirations is gone. At least one reporter um, opine that Carr has issues with McDaniels and the crew. Either way, they have to recover in time, blah, 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 blah. Carr was, quote, pissed off at some of his teammates' effort, but I think this is another indictment of McDaniels and his staff. I'm telling you, I'm going to – you can point the finger at Carr, say he's not great enough. You can point your finger at the offensive line. You can point your finger at the defense. There's enough quality pieces where I am pointing all of the fingers – what do they say? Point four fingers at you and one at me or something like that with the thumb. Anyways, I'm pointing all fingers and thumbs, almost like a, like a uh, like a Marvel character, like electricity coming out of my fingers and thumbs. I'm pointing all of them, all of my digits, feet included, at, at the coaching staff. But, yeah, I mean, it sounds like Carr's getting fed up, too. Look, he's he's fed up enough that he's crying – which we haven't seen him do previously in his career, right? He's not like it's true. This in, is the first cry, first first career cry for Carr. Yeah. So this is like he's not one of these like super erratic emotional characters, but it's it's been rough, and he has invested a lot of time and effort into uh, being successful. I mean, maybe it's just frustration that he's now coming to the realization that he's not good. Maybe that's why he's crying. Because I I oh, had that come moment. on, come on. I had that moment. Look, no, no. Read the room, man. Maybe he, maybe he finally is just like, oh, guess what, guys? I am not good. And so he <sighs> cried about it. All right. We're going to have another Jimmy G breakdown. So I'm just going to move on. Oh, I found the guy. My guy. Uh, uh, it's my, uh, what do they call it? It's my ghost writer. So this really was by Zachariah Slenderbrook, but he got, his pen name is uh, Seth Walder. Uh, he had an interesting take on the Raiders, believing that they are poised to make a run. <laughs> he predicted you're, that they would win. What? You're, what? Your uh, nom de plume, your Ghost Rider name, is Seth Balder. I love it. Walder. Walder oh. with a W. Seth I still Walder. have my hair. Thankfully. Slightly better. He, pred- <laughs> he predicted that they would win, quote, at least eight games and maybe more. Quote, maybe even nine if things go really well. Either way, the Las, Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders are poised for a second-half resurgence. There's no reason their record should be as bad as it is. Their longstanding offensive line issue has been remedied and they, as they rank 16th in pass block win rate and 6th in black, uh, block win rate. And the offense overall is still producing, ranking 12th in offense expected points added per play. Woo-wee! Yeah, this is before the Colts game. I should hit up Seth, see hey. how he feels now. If he's yeah. giving up like me, has he has he jumped off the Titanic? 
old old takes exposed is just gonna snap on him when they're just like poised for a second half resurgency. Look, Raiders, here here's what happens. Okay. If you go on the road to mile high this weekend and you lose to Corny Russell oh, Wilson God. and the Broncos. A team, a, a team that seems to have just as much turmoil as the Raiders. If you go and you lose to Corny Russell Wilson and the Broncos, you have to just cancel the rest of the year. You just have to, to forfeit the rest of your games and don't, don't play. I think the NFL will allow that. And I think, yeah. I think Mark Davis needs the pocket change of however many people show up. Uh, you know it was bad. Oh, the, I told you about the linebacker problems. Uh, the guy who was regulated to inactive every week for the past month ended up starting and playing every single snap. That would be Jayon Brown last week for the Raiders. And they and nobody tackled. I mean, I don't even know how many missed tackles there were, but it was just pathetic to watch. Anyways, is that enough Raiders for you? I mean, I think this is the most Raiders we've done since we started the podcast, but I felt like there was so much. This almost feels like the funeral for the Raiders. Uh, I feel like we had to get it all out, you know, like just put our heart on the line and just get everything off our chest. I'm not saying we're not going to talk about the Raiders moving forward. It's obviously the Silver and Zach podcast, but good God. I mean, that that felt like rock bottom. I'm not saying that they're going to go on a streak. I'm not going to be delusional, nothing like that. But I felt like we spent as much time as we did this week because there was just so many different things, mainly off the field, because nothing good to talk about on the field that we had to that we had to talk about. It was really bad, embarrassingly bad, and I don't think yeah. it's rock bottom. I think it's going to get worse at some point, and I'm not happy to say that to you. The Bills Vikings game, the best regular season game that you ever saw in your life. Ooh, no. Best regular season game I ever saw in my life was Monday Night Football, John Elway, Joe Montana, Broncos, Chiefs, whatever year that was. Uh, that was an incredible, incredible game. I think the lead changed four times in the fourth quarter, back and forth duel between two Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Can't get much better than that. All right, last one was the Jefferson catch on fourth and 10, the best regular season catch that you saw because I had multi, I saw multiple reputable people say that regular season. Uh, sure. Yeah. I don't know. There's oh, been some bo- really incredible catches. Boomer, Esi- when- Boomer Esiason said it because he like, he broke down better. that he not only jumped up, ripped it out of the, out of the DB, but then tucked his arm underneath the ground so that the ball didn't hit the ground. He said it was the best regular season catch he's ever seen. It could have been. Uh, I'll, I'll co-sign that. If, if Boomer hasn't seen one better than I certainly haven't. All right. Well, that is bougie first class Sean O'Connell on his way to, where are you going? Detroit? Yeah. Okay. Well, tell the people where they can catch your PFL stuff. That's what you're going for, right? Uh, not, no, that's next week. Uh, by the way, PFL on ESPN pay-per-view on Black Friday. So save yourself 50, save 50 bucks out of your Christmas budget to watch the fights next week. But We'll probably do a podcast before then. All right. Sounds good. We'll have a safe flight on Twitter at Real OC Sports. I'm at Zach Sports, Z A K Sports. For Sean O'Connell, I'm Zach Araya. This has been the Silver and Zach Podcast. Holla, have a safe flight, OC.